Okay, welcome everyone to our 16th annual Lenten Lecture Series here at St. George Greek Orthodox Church. Our uh, Wednesday theme has been Modern Heresies, and uh, we are on our fifth and final lecture this evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about philatism, but before we do that, I want to review what we've done so far in the previous four, four meetings. Uh, the first meeting we covered the, the heresy of secularism. Now, there are many modern heresies. We only chose, or I only chose five to cover, uh, but there's, there's many more that we could choose for, to cover. So maybe that'll be for a future lecture series. When we talk about heresy, the, the, the basic definition, the original definition is uh, from the Greek word to choose or to make a choice. And in the religious context, it means to choose something different than the established and accepted tradition, okay? We talked about in, in that first meeting about atheism, the belief that there is no God, but that's, isn't that interesting that you define it as a belief <laughs> and it's atheism? Uh, we also talked about theism, which is the belief in the existence of God. We talked about deism, which is the belief in the existence of God on evidence of reason and nature only with the rejection of supernatural revelation, which so deism plays really well into, uh, into the subsequent topic of rationalism. But secularism is the distinction between sacred and secular, between religious and non-religious, but in reality this is a false distinction. In other words, to separate things into to secular and sacred. It's a false distinction. The idea that something is not religious is itself a secular idea. And we begin making mistakes by thinking, thinking that the choice, the choice, remember the word choice, eresis, is between religious and non-religious things, rather than teaching how to be present to God at all times and all places, to learn the presence of God in all things and at all times. The created world, everything is good. That's the way God made it. You read, go back to Genesis, you read, in each day of creation, what God made, and at the end of the day, he said, it's good. And when he created human beings, he said, it's very good. So there's really no, no such thing as things that aren't uh, good in and of themselves, that aren't sacred in terms of God's creation. What we could say is that secularism is functional atheism. Those who think that think that way, people who think in secular ways and act in secular ways are practically living as atheists even though they may proclaim a belief in God. Because they're basically saying is, okay, there may, there's a God here, but there's not a God over here and this is where I live. Maybe sometimes I'll go visit there, but I live here where there is no God the secular place. So the second week we covered humanism, and humanism is a system or mode of thought of action in which human interests, values, and dignity predominate. That would be opposed to uh, godly values, dignity, and interests predominate. Humanism em places emphasis on reason, scientific inquiry, and human fulfillment in the natural world, and often rejects the importance of belief in God. So notice the connection between what are, we're going to talk about in a minute, rationalism and humanism. And if you remember 
when I told you I looked up the American Humanist Association online, and their slogan is what? Do you remember what I said? Good without God. That's the American Humanist Association slogan. Good without God, or without a God. And this also points to another belief or another kind of mode of being called agnosticism, which is an intellectual doctrine or attitude affirming the uncertainty of all claims to ultimate knowledge. A denial of knowledge about whether there is or is not a God. An agnostic insists that it is impossible to prove that there is no God and it is impossible to prove that there is a God. We just don't know. So the agnostics kind of like to have it both ways, maybe. The third week, rationalism. We, <coughs> excuse me, we talked about rationalism is the view that regards reason as the chief source and test of knowledge. The criterion of truth is not sensory, that's empiricism. Empiricism is I know, I have knowledge about the world around me because I, of what I can taste, touch, see, and hear. In, but rationalism is based on the intellect. And of course, this rises out of the age of reason, an intellectual movement which dominated the world of ideas in Europe during the 18th century. 1700s, which centered on reason as the primary source of authority and legitimacy. But this really actually came out of an earlier movement of what we call scholasticism, which was a method of critical thought do that dominated teaching uh, in the medieval universities of Europe from about the 12th to the 15th, I'm sorry, the 12th to the 18th century. And it was done to uh, articulate and defend dogma in an increasingly pluralistic context. That's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we talked about last week, which I'll review in a minute. Scholasticism originated as an outgrowth and a departure from the Christian monastic schools at the earliest European universities. And this is, very, this is also interesting because it connects to what we just celebrated in the Orthodox Church a few Sundays ago, Isikia, Hezekasm, and Gregory Palamas championing scholasticism, I'm sorry, it's championing Isikia, the prayer of the heart. So if you compare scholasticism with the Orthodox doctrine of theoria, Eastern theologians assert that Christianity is the truth that Christianity is in essence the one true way to know the true God who is the origin and the originator of all things, both seen and unseen, knowable and unknowable. Christianity is an apodictic truth, which is in contrast to the dialectic or theania or rationalized knowledge that is arrived at that is the, uh, arrives at truth by way of philosophical speculation. In other words, I know things because I think about them a lot. <laughs> Theoria is obtained according to Eastern Orthodox theology by way of contemplative prayer called hesychasm and is the vision of God as the uncreated light, the light that the disciples, the apostles saw on Mount Tabor when Jesus transfigured before him, before them. St. Gregory Palamas, who lived in the 14th century and championed hesychasm, explicitly stated that he himself had seen the uncreated light of Tabor and had the vision of God, and he called it theoria. You've, we've all heard the word theosis, also in English called deification, but uh, theosis and deification are obtained through the practice of hesychasm. And there's, uh, there's three stages in the spiritual life. There's catharsis, or cleansing through repentance. There's photisis, or illumination. This is what Gregory calls theoria. 
And then thirdly and finally is deification or theosis, union with God. So last week we talked about pluralism. Religious pluralism is an attitude or policy regarding the diversity of religious belief systems coexisting in society. And uh, it connects with, uh, this is, and this is where it's really problematic, with relativism. You know, like I said, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many isms, so many heresies out there. But uh, rel relativism is the belief that all religions are equal in their value and that, and that none of the religions give access to absolute truth. Likewise, syncretism is the attempt to take over creeds of practices, or creeds and practices from other religions, or even to blend practices and creeds from different religions into a new faith. So there are three ways to approach pl religious pluralism. There is, um, first of all, exclusivism, which basically would say that salvation in God is only for Christians. The other extreme of that is uh, cultural pluralism that would say, <coughs> excuse me, that would say non-Christians, uh, in other words, everybody are saved by their religious practices. What we as Orthodox, uh, the way we approach religious pluralism is what was called inclusivism which says that non-Christians may be saved, not, not for sure, but may be saved despite their religious practices by the mercy of God who alone judges the hearts of all people. So, it is a strongly held orthodox view that our commitment to Christian truth affirms a pluralistic democratic setting where all people can live in peace and harmony. In other words, we may not share the same religion, the same belief in God, but we are called to live in peace and harmony to love our neighbor, okay? Holding fast to the truth of Christianity, though, I mean, in other words, that doesn't mean that we, we, we have to somehow jettison our Christian beliefs when we come in contact with people who don't share those beliefs. In a postmodern pluralistic world, there is no truth, no right, no good, and no beauty which all human beings are created to discover, know, and believe, to which they are called to con conform in thought, word, and deed. This is, this is the quotation from Father Thomas Hopko, in which they are privileged to delight and rejoice, and for which they are blessed to give glory and thanksgiving to God. There is no meaning and purpose for all. This is, of course, he's, he's basically describing relativism here. There is, ra there is rather a creation of reality, or rather more accurately, many creations of a plethora of pseudo realities produced by the subjective willings of individuals, parties, and interest groups in the context of politics, power, self-creation, and permissiveness. The tenets of modern liberal democracy in this context, in other words, in this religiously plural uh, context, these, these become objects of worship and ends in themselves in a politicized and hedonized world. In other words, freedom becomes license to do whatever you want. Acquisition becomes a right. I am entitled to that. Differences are deified. We know that one very well now. And happiness, now understood as a material, pseudo spiritual pleasure, becomes obligatory for all. That's consumerism or materialism, another thing we could have talked a lot about. More than a half a century ago, Richard Niebuhr said that in modern American liberal pluralism, there is a God without wrath that brings man without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministry of a Christ without a cross. 
It can now be said that in the new age of post, of, I'm sorry, of, yes, of postmodern pluralism, divinity without his, his reworking of the words, divinity without sovereignty brings humans without dignity into an age without responsibility through the exploitation of a god or goddess of your choice without tragedy. And finally, what Havko said in terms of how Orthodox Christians should deal with and relate with postmodern, the situation of postmodern pluralism is, he, he said there's four things we shouldn't do. <clears throat> Number one, deny that it exists. We do live in a, plur a religiously plural society and world. It's just a fact. Number two, to deny that the members, the people of our churches are immune to its effects. Okay? Our, our people, young and old, are affected by this religious pluralism. Number three, it would be a mistake for us to retreat into a self-made or self-contained refuge. In other words, to you know, build walls around our property here and tell everybody to come live inside and have nothing to do with the people outside. And finally, the last thing that we should not do is fall prey to the postmodern pluralistic worldview that it is somehow a great new opportunity for humankind, which Orthodox Christians should welcome as being inherently consistent with traditional Orthodox views of freedom, personal dignity, cultural diversity, incarnational theology, and apophatic mystical theology. That, that, that brings us to tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about philatism. Philatism is spelled P-H-Y-L-E-T-I-S-M, and it's not found in dictionaries. It's not a word that it's, you can't find it in, in a dictionary. In fact, interestingly, I couldn't find it at all on the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese website. I did find it uh, on... Wikipedia, there's a little article about it, and I'll share some of the information on there. So, philatism, or more specifically, it might be better to call it ethnophilatism, uh, and the philatism comes from the Greek word philitismos, uh, well, of course, ethnos, is everybody... Who's, who's our Greek speakers here tonight? Ethnos means what? Becca? Culture, Culture or nation. And philitismos means what? Philoctimo. Well, not philoctimo, that's honor. That's a good one. Love of honor, philoctimo. Philitismos is... Well, it's, 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 uh, it's actually tribalism. Is, is really what the translation is. So it's the principle of nationalities applied to the ecclesiastical domain. So, um, in other words, the conflation between church and nation. The term ethnophilitismos designates the idea that a local autocephalous church should be based not on local ecclesiastical criterion, but on an ethno national or linguistic one. Sound familiar? It's what we're living in today in America. Philatism was declared, actually, uh, there was, a, there was a, a council that was called in Constantinople in the year 1872 that declared philatism as an ecclesiological ecclesiological heresy. But there's a little history there that we need to remember. After their emancipation from Ottoman rule, the Balkan churches, you know, the Balkan, you know, everybody knows what we're talking about when we talk about Balkan, talking about Eastern 
<coughs> Eastern Europe, mainly. Balkan churches freely develop both their national identities and their religious life. You've got to, and of course, remember that the Ottomans dominated the Balkans in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean for over 400 years. But when these, these different groups came out from under their, their domination, occupation, persecution, theological faculties were created in cities like Athens in Greece, Belgrade in Yugoslavia, Sofia in Bulgaria, Bucharest in Romania. In fact, the Romanian Orthodox Church introduced the full cycle of the liturgical offices in the vernacular Romanian. But these, some of these positive developments were often marred by nationalistic rivalries. As I said before, the term philatism was coined at the Holy and Great Pan-Orthodox Synod that met in Istanbul, which of course is Constantinople, near 1872. The meeting was prompted by the creation of a separate bishopric by the Bulgarian community of Istanbul for parishes only open to Bulgarians. It was the first time in church history that a separate diocese was established based on ethnic identity rather than principles of orthodoxy and territory. The August 10, 1872 Synod issued a official condemnation of ecclesiastical racism or ethnophilitism as well as its theological argumentation. It said, we renounce, censure, and condemn philatism that is, racial discrimination, ethnic feuds, hatreds, and dissensions within the Church of Christ as contrary to the teaching of the Gospel and the holy canons of our Blessed Fathers, which support the Holy Church and the entire Christian world, embellish it and lead it to divine godliness. In, in condemning philatism, the Synod in Constantinople had in fact divine, defined a basic problem of modern orthodoxy. So that brings us to, to our situation today, which as I alluded to earlier is that we, we are divided along ethnic lines as churches in America. That's the way our churches are governed is according to ethnic dioceses and, and uh, uh, jurisdictions is the word we use. So we have the Greek Orthodox Church, we have the Romanian Orthodox Church, we have the Serbian Orthodox Church, we have the Antiochian Orthodox Church, uh, all these different groups, and they have bishops with overlapping dioceses. The original um, and canonically correct form of church government is one bishop for each diocese, and it is based on a geographic region. So you would never have two bishops in the same geographic region ruling. But you have exactly the opposite situation here in America, where you have multiple bishops ruling over the same geographical areas. And for example, uh, there are probably, if I remember correctly, at least about six to eight bishops that reside in Chicago that oversee somewhat similar geographic areas like our Greek Orthodox metrop Metropolitan of Yakovos. Uh, but we have no bishops in many other major cities, such as the Twin Cities. We don't. We have a major metropolitan area of three million people with, uh, with 20 Orthodox churches just in the Twin Cities and probably 30 to 35 Orthodox churches in the state of Minnesota and western Wisconsin with no bishop. In a sense, no meaning no bishop centered here in this area. Now, this, this presents a challenge because, uh, as some of us may know, if we grew up in the church, that uh, oftentimes church was confused with the ethnic identity. You know, if somebody said, are you, you know, are you, uh, are you a Christian? No, I'm a Greek. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute. 
uh, or I mean, still some people even in our community, if that phone rings, how are they going to answer it? Greek church. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm old enough. When I was a, let's say, a young, early young adult, and the back then I had blonde hair and blue eyes. I walk into my own church that I grew up at, St. Mary's Greek Orthodox Church, and some of the old Greeks would say, "What are you doing here? Are you are you Orthodox? Are you Greek?" Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm Greek. Well, you don't look Greek. You, are you sure you belong here? So, I mean, these these people are um, not necessarily uh, have ill will, but it's just the idea that their that their ethnic identity was so fused with their religious identity that they could not understand why somebody who doesn't look Greek is in a Greek Orthodox church. And in fact, when I was first ordained a priest, I served in Chicago, and during the Vespers of the feast day Vespers of the various parishes, there's about 20 Greek Orthodox churches in the Chicago area, um, you know, all the priests would go to celebrate together, and during the Vespers you have a procession, and you walk out with a procession, and I'm, again, probably the, one of the only ones with blonde hair, blue eyes, and everybody's, who's that priest? Who's that priest? <laughs> so, as you've probably heard me say at various uh, gatherings, uh, meetings, throughout the history of our parish, uh, we have a challenge now because even people who are not familiar with our traditions, who are not Orthodox, when they, I mean, and, and we have a, in many ways I think we have a very welcoming community, especially for people who are coming in for the very first time. But it's difficult, I think, for people to walk through the doors of our church when they see the word Greek on the, on the outside of the church. Uh, it's because they think, well, I'm not Greek, and I don't speak Greek. I must, that must not be the church for me. And I think Father, uh, was it Father Barnabas who was talking about the Korean Presbyterian Church? Who was, yeah. So, he, I mean, we don't, even, we, don't, we don't think of our own, own church that way, but if we went walk by a Korean Presbyterian Church, we would think, well, it's only for Koreans, right? And that's the way people think about our church. Greek Orthodox means it's only for Greeks. So we have a challenge to, uh, to do everything that we can to make sure that people know that they, are, uh, that they don't have to be Greek, they don't have to speak Greek, to be welcome in our churches and even to consider becoming members of our churches. Metropolitan Jonah spoke to this issue. Metropolitan Jonah was the uh, lead hierarch, the highest ruling bishop in the OCA, Orthodox Church of America, about 10 years ago. And <coughs> he delivered, delivered a, a talk at a conference, and he said the following. He says, almost all national churches have extended their jurisdictions beyond the geographic and political boundaries to the so-called diaspora. But Orthodox Christians who are faithful to the gospel and the fathers could not admit of any such thing as a diaspora of Christians. Only ethnic groups can be dispersed among other ethnic groups. Yet the essential principle of geographic, canonical boundaries of Episcopal and synodal jurisdiction has been abrogated. And every patriarchate, every mother church, now effectively claims universal jurisdiction to serve its people in diaspora. In, in diaspora means the spreading abroad. The confusion of ethnic identity and Orthodox Christian identity expressed by competing ecclesiastical jurisdictions is the incarnation of philatism. 
due to this confusion of the gospel with ethnic or political identities, multiple parallel communities, each with its own allegiance to a foreign mother church, divide the Orthodox Church in North America and elsewhere into ethnic and political denominations. This distorts the apostolic vision and has severely compromised the Catholicity of the Orthodox Churches, in which all Christians in a given territory are called to submit to a local synod of bishops. The problem is not so much the multiple overlapping jurisdictions, each ministering to diverse elements of the population. This could be adapted as a means of dealing with the legitimate diversity of ministries within a local or national church. The problem is, is that there is no common expression of unity that supersedes the ethnic, linguistic, and cultural divisions. There is no synod of bishops responsible for all the churches in America, and no primacy or point of accountability in the Orthodox world with the authority to correct such a situation. Now, this article may have been written before the formation uh, of the Assembly of Bishops, which is, was, was formed, it's more or less all of the bishops of all of the jurisdictions in America are gathering at least yearly, probably twice a year, with the, with the, the command or the call or the direction of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew to resolve this situation. And they've been meeting, this has been going on now for at least three or four years. But it's a slow process, and it's going to take time to come to, uh, to, to a resolution. But they're trying to, to work through all of the issues that are involved in having a common uh, uh, synod of bishops that are in charge of all of uh, the Orthodox Christians in America. The pro, you know, one of the problems is that some of those bishops that live in Chicago are going to have to go live somewhere else. You know, become some somebody's might have to go out to Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, you know, or, and that's I think those are those are some of the practical issues. Is that who wants to give up their big metropolis of Chicago that oversees how many states and then become a bishop of a smaller region? out in some much more distant or isolated locale. So that's, that's just, that's just one thing. But I think it's important for us, and we can uh, wrap up soon with questions and answers, it's important for us to remember St. Paul's words, you know, he says that there's neither Jew nor Greek, we are all one in Jesus Christ. So we uh, we shouldn't let our ethnic identities separate us uh, from each other. Should not let those be more important than our common faith in Christ. All right. Any questions? Any? Yeah, I, I think it wouldn't be a problem for local churches if, you know, if they're predominantly of one nationality to continue to call themselves that. And they may have uh, something like a vicar or somebody who uh, may assist the local bishop who may not share that same ethnic background in ministering to those communities. And those communities can maintain their own, their, their original liturgical traditions as well, and even use their own language. The point is, is that, that uh, you would, would no longer have overlapping jurisdictions where you were, you know, you know, we have how many parishes here, and we were, you know, depending on our ethnic jurisdiction, we report to different bishops, and we have no bishop within 400 miles, right? It's, that's, that's, and I think, as, as many of you know, lived here for a while, I mean, we, Thank God, we do have a very strong 
Pan Orthodox community here, arguably one of the strongest in the United States. And that's because of the vision of, of the previous generation of priests who served here, such as Father Anthony Quineris, Father John Corey, Father Thaddeus Wojcik, and some of those other, other priests who said we need to come together as a, as a